in our last two lessons we got to know about the ahom and the gond kingdoms and in those lessons we got to know how these tribes were inspired by the success stories of the rajput rulers and by being inspired by those stories they considered the rajput rulers as their role models which is why from being mere tribals these people now went on to forming their own kingdoms they amassed wealth they gained prominence and power and influence in different regions of the indian subcontinent but do you think that the ahoms and the gonds were the only tribes that lived in the indian subcontinent around the time we are talking about in this lesson definitely not because there were several tribes that were spread in different regions of the indian subcontinent and this lesson is devoted to learning about those tribes so let us now embark on this journey and find out more about the various tribes that lived in different parts of the subcontinent we have to begin this discussion by talking about the chero chiefdoms now why are the chero chiefdoms of any importance to us firstly you have to remember the time around which the chero chiefdoms emerged the chero chiefdoms emerged by the 12th century a point that we have been discussing all along is that we have to talk about the geographical location of these tribes why is it so because the geographical locations played a major role in shaping the lives of these tribals now in this regard the question that we have to answer is that where were these chero chiefdoms located these chero chiefdoms were located in regions that fall in the present day indian states of bihar and jharkhand but this is just an introductory point on the chero chiefdoms we have to learn about the chero chiefdoms in greater detail and so let us now find out more about the history of the chero chiefdoms i'm sure you know about the mighty mughal emperor that akbar was now raja man singh was one of akbar's most prominent generals why are we talking about raja man singh here This is because Raja Man Singh attacked and defeated the Cheros in 1591. But do you think that the Mughal Empire at large under the leadership of Raja Man Singh who was the general of Akbar managed to defeat the Cheros completely? Most definitely not. This is because under the leadership of Raja Man Singh while the Mughal empire managed to defeat and subdue the Cheros this did not last for long that is to say they could not defeat and vanquish the Cheros altogether the Cheros in this time in 1591 were not completely defeated by the Mughal empire but unfortunately centuries later it was the mughal emperor aurangzeb who defeated the cheros so what did we learn about the history of the cheros firstly in the year 1591 when raja man singh attacked and defeated the cheros this defeat did not last long this is because the cheros could fight back but finally aurangzeb defeated and subjugated the cheros and with this this chero kingdom or this chero chiefdom was brought under the control of the mughal empire another very important point that we have to keep in mind in this regard is that the mughal empire under the leadership of different mughal rulers expanded in size this empire went on to conquering and bringing under its control major parts of the indian subcontinent and with this in mind we have to talk about how the mughal empire grew in size by subjugating various tribes and one such instance was the subjugation of the chero chiefdom while beginning this discussion we talked about how we will talk about various tribes that ruled and stayed in different parts of the indian subcontinent in this regard we also have to mention the khokha tribe where did this khokha tribe live this khokha tribe could be found in punjab and this tribe lived between the 13th and the 14th centuries on this map you could locate the region where the khokha tribe lived between the 13th and the 14th centuries in the same region of punjab there was another major and very powerful tribe that was known as the gakhars 
Now, who were these Gakhars? These Gakhars were a clan of Punjabi Muslims, and these people, or these tribals to be very specific, predominantly lived in the Potohar Plateau. Now, on this map, you could see the places where the Gakhars lived, and this is the Potohar Plateau to be specific. The Potohar Plateau is located in the northern part of the Punjab province, and this place now lies in Pakistan. So this is the place where the Gakhars lived. Now, how are the Gakhars important in our discussion? This is because the Gakhars were landowners in Punjab during the reign of the Mughal Emperor Babur. And you should also know that as landowners, the Gakhars exerted their influence on this region. They were very powerful and influential in the Potohar Plateau region. While we discuss the power and the influence of the Gakhars, mention must be made of the Gakhar chief, Kamal Khan Gakhar. Now, out of all the Gakhar chiefs, why are we talking about Kamal Khan Gakhar? This is because Kamal Khan Gakhar was made a Mansabdar by the Mughal Emperor Akbar. So, we learned that the Gakhars were predominantly located in the Punjab province that is now situated in Pakistan. And here we also got to know about how the Gakhars were landowners and they lived in that region during the rule of the Mughal Emperor Babur. And it was this tribal chief Kamal Khan Gakhar who was made a Mansabdar by Akbar. Now, a very important question that must be coming to your mind is that, what does the term Mansabdar mean? Now, for this, we have to trace the etymology of the word Mansab. The word Mansab is an Arabic word. And what does it mean? This means rank or position. Now, from where do we derive this concept of a Mansabdar? And how was Kamal Khan Gakhar important as a Mansabdar? Let us now find out about this entire Mansabdari system that was instituted by the Mughal Emperor Akbar. Before proceeding with this lesson, let me ask you a question. What does the word Mansab mean? Will you be able to help me with an answer to this question? Does Mansab mean a tax, a rank, an irrigation system or a tribe? Well, the correct answer is rank. The word mansab is an Arabic word which means rank or position. Now let us find out more about the mansabdari system. A point that we just raised is that the mansabdari system was a system that was instituted by the Mughal Emperor Akbar. Now mansabdar was a military unit. For this, we have to understand that this Mansabdari system was a type of administrative system that was brought into place by Akbar. And within this Mansabdari system, Mansabdar was a military unit. Now, this very word Mansab, as we have already learned, means a rank or a position. That is to say, these Mansabdars were people who held important positions, be that in the military or in the administrative system. So, these Mansabdars were people who held power during the rule of Akbar. Now, how was this Mansabdari system implemented? Try to understand this very clearly. Hire the Mansab means hire the position of that person. Now, military and other officials who worked during the rule of Akbar was given a Mansab. And this determined the rank of that official or the rank of that army man. Now, this also determined the income or the allowances that was given to that Mansabdar. This Mansabdari system also meant that hire the Mansab or higher the position of that person, that person will also have to maintain a higher number of cavalrymen and troops. So, this was the Mansabdari system that was brought into place by the Mughal Emperor Akbar. And just a while ago, we talked about how the Gakhar chief Kamal Khan Gakhar was made a Mansab by Akbar. So, can you understand how important these Gakhars might have been?
This is because we have learnt in our previous lessons that these tribals wanted to seclude and segregate themselves from the mainstream society. But despite living on the fringes of the society, they went on to holding important official positions and one such position was the Mansabdar position. In our previous lessons, we talked about how the tribals wanted to seclude and isolate themselves from the mainstream society in order to retain their autonomy and independence. But here we got to learn how many of these tribes were very important, which is why many tribal chiefs went on to assuming and occupying important positions in the society and one such rank was the Mansabdar. In our previous lesson, we discussed how the Gond Kingdom met its end at the hands of the Mughal Empire. This is because this kingdom was defeated by the Mughals. Now from this, we can also infer that the Mughal Empire played a major role in bringing an end to various tribes in different parts of the Indian subcontinent. The Mughal emperors were very keen on expanding their territories. They were very keen on expanding the empire as a whole, which is why they subjugated and brought under their control various kingdoms, various tribes. In this regard, mention must be made of the Langas and the Arghuns. Who were the Langas and the Arghuns? These were tribes that lived between the 15th and the 16th centuries. And where did they live? They lived in Multan and Sindh. Now the Langas and the Arguns, as you can see, dominated an extensive region in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. But to their misfortune, they were also defeated by the Mughals. So it was the Mughal Empire that subjugated and brought under its control the Langas and the Arghuns that lived in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent between the 15th and the 16th centuries. In this same region lived another group of people who were known as the Balochis. Who were the Balochis? The Balochis were a large and powerful tribe who were found in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. The region in which the Balochis lived was known as Balochistan and the Balochistan or this region was located around the Iranian plateau. So here you can see the place where the Balochis lived. Now let us briefly touch upon the administrative system of the Balochis. This tribe was divided into several smaller clans. And these smaller clans were again ruled by their own chiefs. So this is something that we get to know about the Balochis who lived in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. All this while the various tribes we were talking about were found in the northern and the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. And as a brief recap, let us go over the names of the tribes that we discussed in this lesson. We talked about the Langas, the Arghuns, the Khokar, Gakkars and the Baluchis. All of them were found in the northern and northwestern part of the subcontinent. From this region, let us now travel to a different area and find out about the tribes that were found there. What we are discussing here are the Gaddis. Now who were these Gaddis? The Gaddis were a shepherd tribe who lived in the western Himalaya. So, this is the region where the Gaddis live. Now, to be very specific, the Gaddis lived in the modern day Indian states of Himachal Pradesh and Jammu and Kashmir. So, it is time to find out more about the lives of this Shefer tribe of Gaddis. The Gaddis were a nomadic tribe. This is a discussion that we will come to later. But for that, in order to understand why the Gaddis were nomads, we have to talk about the geographical location of this tribe. This tribe, as we just discussed, was found in the western Himalayas. And to be very specific, this tribe was found in the present day Indian state of Himachal Pradesh and the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, who were the nomads? Nomads were people who used to move from one place to another. That is to say, they did not have a formal and a permanent settlement. 
they did not have homes like you and I do. So these nomads were people who travelled extensively across vast regions. Now in this regard, we have to trace the reason why these Gaddis were nomads. Now for this, we have to talk briefly about the geographical location of Jammu and Kashmir and Himachal Pradesh. These are places which are severely cold. So during winter, the Gaddis or this shepherd tribe was compelled to leave these places and move to relatively warmer regions, which is why these people were nomadic in nature. So this is also another point that we get to know about the lifestyle of the Gaddis. Now let us travel to the northeastern part of the Indian subcontinent. This is the northeastern region of the Indian subcontinent. Now all this while we talked about various tribes that lived in the northern and the northwestern part of the subcontinent. Now which tribes lived in the northeastern part of the subcontinent? Among the various tribes that lived here, mention must be made of the Nagas and the Ahoms. The Nagas lived to be very specific in the modern day Indian state of Nagaland and the Ahoms are a tribe that we have already discussed in our previous lesson. So the Nagas and the Ahoms were dominant tribes that lived in the northeastern part of the Indian subcontinent. Along with that we have to also talk about few other tribes that lived in this region. And among those tribes we have to talk about the Khasis and the Koches. Now where did the Khasis live? The Khasis live in the present day Indian state of Meghalaya. And here we also have to keep another point in mind that the coaches were not restricted to the extreme northeastern part of the Indian subcontinent. This is because they lived on the northern part of the Indian state of West Bengal. So here is the place where the coaches live. And in the northeastern part of the Indian subcontinent, these are few of the tribes that used to live and still live even today. Now let us make a quick list of the various tribes that live in the western and the southern part of the Indian subcontinent. Here we have to talk about the Kolis and the Berads who lived on the highlands of the Indian state of Maharashtra. So these are the places where the Kolis lived. The Kolis were also spread in some parts of the present day state of Gujarat. So this is the region where the Kolis live and this is the place where the Berads lived. In the southern part of the Indian subcontinent lived some very powerful tribes like the Koragas, the Vetars and the Maravars. Now let us travel to the central part of the subcontinent. Here lived a very large and extensively powerful tribe that was known as the Bhils. Where did the Bhils live? The Bhils used to live across the western and central India and in this regard you should also keep in mind that the Bhils live around this region even today. Now when we talk about the western and central India which states are we talking about to be specific? In the western India we are referring to the present day Indian state of Rajasthan and in central India we are talking about Madhya Pradesh. So these are the regions where the Bhils used to live. Now you will be surprised to know a very important fact about the Bhils. What is it? Let us find that out. The Bhils were such a powerful and important tribe that some big kings and kingdoms like Rana Sangha of Rajasthan also used to seek help from the Bhils. So we have been discussing in many of our lessons that the tribals lived on the fringes of the society, they lived as outcasts, they lived as people who did not want to belong to the mainstream society. But in fact powerful rulers and kings also relied upon the help that was extended by certain tribes and one such tribe was the Bhils. Now let us talk about how these Bhils evolved over time. 
Now these tribals did not restrict themselves to being tribals and nomadic all the while. Because like societies undergo change and go through processes of evolution, these tribals also go through similar processes of change and development. Over time, these tribals get incorporated into the mainstream society. We also learned about how these tribals assume certain important positions. Similarly, by the 16th century, many of these bills had become settled agriculturists. By settled agriculturists, we mean that they had settled in particular regions where they pursued agriculture. And by practicing agriculture in those places, they grew food for themselves. That is to say, they no longer lived like nomads in the forests or outside the mainstream society. And in fact, many bhils also became zamindars. So can you imagine how much power and wealth these bhils must have amassed that they became zamindars, that they became important people within the mainstream societies. But do you think this process of evolution and change is always homogeneous? That is, all the people within the same tribe will want to evolve and get incorporated into the mainstream society? This never happens. This is because these tribes are also heterogeneous units. They had several smaller clans within themselves, which is why this was never a homogeneous unit. They did not have a uniform progress or evolution. And with this in mind, we have to talk about certain Bhil clans that remained hunter-gatherers. While on the one hand, we have certain Bhil clans that became settled agriculturists and zamindars, some Bhil clans still chose to remain hunter-gatherers. And this illustration shows you how these Bhil clans remained hunter-gatherers. These hunter-gatherers were people who used to hunt animals which were easier to hunt and they used to gather different kinds of fruits, honey and forest produces which they used for their own sustenance. Now this illustration shows you how many Bhil clans after they chose to remain hunter-gatherers went on to hunt even in the nights. This shows you how these Bhil members have gone to hunt a pack of deer in the dead of the night. So this speaks to the fact that the Bhil clans did not undergo this process of evolution in a uniform kind of way. Now why do you think is this person holding something like a torch here? Torches were something that were not found in ancient and medieval India. So how is it possible that this person was holding a torch? This torch is figurative or symbolic of the night time. These members of the Bhil clans who remained hunter-gatherers used something like a torch to hunt packs of deer and other animals even in the middle of the night. Any discussion on tribes in India shall remain incomplete without the mention of Bishamunda. Who was Bishamunda? Bishamunda was a chief of the Munda tribe. Now where was this Munda tribe found? This Munda tribe could be found in the present day Indian state of Jharkhand and these Munda still live in various parts of the country even today. Now why are we mentioning Bisha Munda to be very specific? Because he was a fearless warrior and fighter and in fact you should keep in mind that he gave a tough fight to the Britishers when they came to encroach upon their territory. So you can understand that these tribals were in no way very coward. They were very courageous. They were very powerful. They wanted to retain their autonomy and whenever it came to preserving their independence, they left no stones unturned in trying their best to maintain and preserve their culture, their tradition. And this is something that Bishamunda had also done, which is why he has been a very important tribal leader in the pages of history. The Mundas and the Santals were very important tribes in the Chotanagpur plateau. So this is the region where the Mundas and the Santals used to live and still live even today. And to be very specific, we have to list the states in which these people live. These people live in the present Indian states of Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Odisha and Bengal. 
and in fact the santals are one of the largest and most important tribes that exist today in the country the mundas are not so powerful and vastly spread across different parts of the country like the santals but in this regard we have to keep this point in mind that the mundas have also managed to maintain their independence Many Munda tribals still have not agreed or assented to bring themselves into the mainstream society. They still hold on to their tradition, their religion, their belief system and in this way they have retained their autonomy and their independence from the dominance of the mainstream societies. With this, we come to an end of our discussion on the various tribes that could be found in different parts of the Indian subcontinent. Here we learnt about quite a few tribes that were spread in the northern, northwestern, northeastern and the southern parts of the Indian subcontinent. From here we got to know about how many of these tribes over time have been incorporated into the mainstream societies. We also learnt about how many of these tribes have retained their independence and they still continue to remain as autonomous and independent tribes even in today's India. We will now focus on the lives of these tribals and these nomadic people. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.